Carolyn Zenk, environmental attorney, next on Environment Long Island. Welcome to Environment Long Island. I am Carl Grossman, and with me is Carolyn Zenk, who I recall you coming to my house, Carolyn, decades ago. You were working then for the group for the South Fork, now the group for the East End, and they had you, Charles Raybeck and Audrey Raybeck, they were the co-directors, had you come, and we talked about the, my experience with the environment on Long Island, and from there, Carolyn went on to law school. You went on to Oregon. You went way out to the West Coast. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. And you got degrees in? I got a certificate in ocean and coastal law and then environment and natural resources law. And you came back here and you became general counsel to the, to the group, yep. mm -hmm. a higher level in the group. And then you got into politics. You ran for yes. the Southampton Town Board and you were a member for, what was it, four years? Yes. Mm -hmm. And well, ever since then, you've been an active, on your own, environmental lawyer fighting all kind of good fights, and particularly, uh, well, in recent times, the fight over what's called the hills right. in right. East Quag. Describe what you have against the hills okay. in East Quag, Carolyn. Well, first, let me say uh, thank you for inviting me on your show, Carl. And Carl's one of the great activists of the East End and an amazing re investigative reporter, did a lot of work on Shoreham. Um, he's just a great guy. And I first met him in my 20s many years ago, and we were uh, interviewing him for a, a big award at the time for all of his great work for the East End. So I want to thank you, Carl, for everything you've done. Thank you, dear. And tell you what a pleasure it is to be on your show. Um, the Hills. Uh, the Hills is in East Quogue. It's one of the uh, largest pieces of land left in the Pine Barrens. And there is a, was a huge housing project proposed for it along with a uh, championship level golf course. And we wouldn't necessarily at the uh, you know, group for the East End or with the group I worked with, which is called Clean, oppose that uh, if it wasn't in the wrong place. But it's in the wrong place. It's right at the top of what I would call the Water Hill for the East End, and that's where the water begins. And as the old saying goes, Jack and Jill went up the hill to get a you know, pail of water. So when the water is kept clean at the top of the water hill, where it's the deepest, by the way, and it flows down off the water hill, it cleans all of the public wells along the way and all of the private wells. So the problem was the hills were proposing, I think, 50 different uh, uh, pesticides, some of which were carcinogens and neurotoxins. They'd use that for the golf course. They'd use that for the golf course. And um, it would be a private golf course, too. Uh, a private golf course, yeah, not open to the public. So that the, there was some very important zoning passed in the 80s on the East End. Uh, it was a five-acre zone, and there's something called an Aqua Protection Overlay District. And the basic idea was to keep it as natural as possible up on the spine of the island or at that water hill. And the idea was to keep it forested, to have as few lawns as possible, and you certainly, in your wildest dreams, would never have toxic uses, which would be something like uh, you know, a golf course or a nuclear power plant or anything generating any number of chemicals on the top of the hill. Because the idea, ideally, um, it should be all forested up there. But the government didn't have the money to buy it all, so they upzoned it to five acres. They only allowed one house every five acres and very limited lawns uh, so that you wouldn't get any chemicals up there. So that, that's the major objection, but there's, there's so many other objections well, too. The, the Southampton Zoning Board of Appeals made a decision which was kind of controversial. Uh, yes. uh, essentially approved, it, but descri describe it legally. Yeah, um, originally there was a, a zone in place that's been very discredited. It's the um, PDD zone, uh, Plan Development District. And it used to be in the old days, you were not allowed to do contract zoning, which is a form of, I, I hate to say it, it's zoning for sale or it's, you could even call it a form of bribery zoning. It was considered illegal by the courts. 
Then at one point it was decided to allow the PDD zone because they figured there might be some public benefits. So originally the fight with all of the major environmental groups was to prevent this change of zone to this PDD, which now is defunct. Um, and they won, and it was quite a battle. Several years, uh, and they, they won. The or they, town won. The, the public won, in my okay. view, because it was a protection of the five-acre zone, and the developers lost, and the environmental community had won. And that was a very difficult decision to get. So everyone, yay, we won. You know, so it was sort of like slaying. You know the, the, the monster stories now, Carl? It's like you slay Godzilla once, and then the monster always gets up again. Well, yeah. the monster got up again. After they were defeated, the, the developers wouldn't take no for an answer. And they did an end run, and they went to our Southampton Zoning Board of Appeals, which frankly didn't have the kind of background that they needed to make a decision in this case. I should, I should insert that my son, yeah. Adam Grossman, is the chairman of the Southampton Zoning right. Board of Appeals, and he voted against what a majority of members yes, voted Yes, Adam for. showed a lot of backbone in this, and Adam uh, uh, voted, uh, voted it down. Voted it, they, they basically were arguing that the, uh, the golf course was an accessory you know, use and structure. He did, Helen Burgess also voted it down, so some of them did. But the problem was the zoning board was isolated, I think, by council, and they all, the way they do the procedures, they're talked to individually or emailed individually, and they don't meet in a group. Usually under the sunshine laws of the state of New York, you meet in a group and you discuss and the public sees how you're making decisions. And I feel had Adam been in the room, given his expertise as a lawyer, um, and just the fact that he's a great guy and usually works in the public interest, and, and had Helen been in the room, I believe they might have been able to persuade the other uh, zoning board members to not make an end run. You know, after the town board had said no, I don't think the developer had any business you know, coming to the planning board and keeping with the plan, the planning board punted it over to the zoning board, and I think everyone was shocked by the zoning board's decision. The reason it's shocking is because usually an accessory use is something like, um, it goes without saying, it's customary or incidental to a home. So for example, it might be a garage, a shed, a flagpole, um, a driveway. But an <coughs> accessory use is not an 18-hole golf 18 course. 18-hole, 100-acre golf course, and they threw in a 10-plex multiple dwelling into their application, which was hidden until I brought it to the zoning board's attention. So this idea of that being accessory to a single-family home is, uh, has very far-reaching ramifications, Carl, because the, the area the zoning board was allowing it on was the op what's called the open space, which is saved by it a cluster law. It's a little complicated, but if you picture a checkerboard with a lot of checkers as houses, uh, developers are allowed a certain number of units. And then this law allows you to reduce, push the checkers to one side, if you will, reduce the size of the lots, and then say half of that board can be left open for open space. So the whole point of the law was to save things like a nice forested pine barrens for drinking water, or a farm field in Bridgehampton that's beautiful to look at, or maybe you'd cluster some of the houses away from Dune so that you can look at a beautiful beach. So that was the intent of the law. And Fred Thiel even wrote to the zoning board and said, hey, the intent of this law is to keep these open spaces in natural resources, that being farmland or pine barrens or whatever it is. They ignored all that and they allowed the developer to put this golf course on the area that should be saved. So this goes far beyond East Quogue and that huge piece of land, uh, like 600 acres or so. This affects all of the farm fields in Bridgehampton that have been saved with the cluster law, all the pine barrens that have been saved with the cluster law, all these natural resources that are saved with the cluster law are now in danger. If it's a golf course, a championship golf course today, I mean, are you going to allow multiplex theaters, a recreational use, racetracks, recreational use, race horsing? I mean, where does this, this end? It's, so a, it's a precedent that... It's a very bad precedent, and it's... it's um, it's pretty boneheaded, frankly. I hate, I hate to use that word, but if, if, when I was before the zoning board, I, I held up the laws of the town of Southampton, and I, and I held up the open space law, and I said, look, this clause says the open space has to stay in natural open space, and it can't be used for active recreation. And the zoning board attorney turns to me and says, well, Ms. Ank, we don't have to pay attention to the Southampton Town Code, that section. We're just going to rule whether it's an accessory use or not. We're just looking like this. I said, well, what makes you think you can ignore, like, you know, several decades of uh, the open space law, and it's what makes you think you can ignore the purpose of the law as it's written? What makes you think you can overturn town policies for uh, generations now? What makes you think you can endanger every farm field in Southampton town? What makes you think you don't have to read that section of the code? Never got a good answer to that. 
and the, the, the council isolated each member, told them they had to do this for some crazy reason, and they, they really set one of the worst precedents in the history of the town of Southampton. Now, what's going to happen now? Well, now, um, uh, God bless the environmental community that we have, and I'll look directly at the audience when I say this. Uh, if you want to help your community, make sure you donate to groups like the Group for the East End, uh, the Pine Barren Society, um, yeah, Conic Land Trust, help, helping with the farmers, um, the Nature Conservancy. Those, the group, these groups are very important, uh, Carl. Um, the groups that have been in the lead on some of the advocacy things, fighting for, as the group for the South Fork says, or East End, fighting for the quality of your life, um, they brought a lawsuit, those, those groups. And so they have now sued the Zoning Board of Appeals and argued that their decision is arbitrary and capricious or irrational. That's the standard. Um, and so that's pending in court. The biggest threats, I mean, the hills is a, <laughs> clearly a, a major threat. The biggest threats to the east end of Long Island, what would they be? Well, I, th I think they're similar to the threats to the nation. I, I would say drinking water is so important, Carl. Um, with the hills uh, application, uh, that five acre zone and that aquifer protection overlay district in Southampton are being you know, challenged, basically overturned, and they're so important. The, in the 80s, people decided that the Suffolk County Health Department standard wasn't good enough. It was 10 milligrams of nitrogen per liter, um, but with it, organic chemical pollution and all that coming in, so the decision was made, we don't want to just have this theory that was uh, what I would call poisoning within limits theory. You can expose me to this number of toxins, but only so much. So the idea was to get a new, new idea, uh, which shouldn't be new, a non-degradation theory. So the idea was rather than allowing people to be, their water to be poisoned up to this limit, we try to keep it clean or at least don't allow it to degrade. So the, that was why we only allowed a few houses up there and wanted to stay, stay natural. So I, I would say drinking water, uh, very, very important. You take even right now, there's a big decision pending in Hampton Bays. So we've had our own water district for many, many years. Mm -hmm. the town boards, uh, our water commissioners of, of Hampton Bays, um, they're thinking, Suffolk County Water Authority was thinking of taking it over. And by the way, I wasn't very impressed with them on the hills. They were getting a free well, I guess, for the developers, and they never came out against it. Even, and they didn't seem to be aware that Southampton doesn't have their standards anymore, which is the 10 milligrams per liter. We went down to a standard that was five times cleaner, two milligrams per this liter. This is the Suffolk County Water Authority. Yeah, the Water Authority just uh, was nowhere in sight. So um, mm. I, in terms of opposing the hills, and they didn't realize the ramifications, and plus they were going to get a free well for the developer, which is a whole other thing. But um, so this, this idea of having a, a non-degradation policy is important. And as far as the Hampton Bay's Water District, the, the, uh, the town board of Southampton was asking people what they thought about it. But they sent out a survey like, it was like five questions. <clears throat> and what they really needed to do was um, maybe do an impact statement if they were going to consider that and really take a look at what is the quality of water in the Hampton Bays Water District versus Suffolk County. You know, what um, pollutants are in the water compared to both? How does it compare to national standards? What kind of piping are you putting the water through? Is there anything dangerous about the piping? What are you adding to the water? Um, to keep it clean. I mean, for example, chlorine is controversial. On the one hand, yeah, it kills the bad bugs if you get them, so it looks good from that point of view. But what are the long-term effects of chlorine? Uh, it's a pretty toxic substance, chlorine. Um, is there a better way to go? So uh, there are these opportunities. Yeah, the, the issue that you're raising is permissible levels of pollution. And a lot of laws on the federal level is, is a thing called a speedies permit, right. in which the government really gives a company a license to pollute to a certain level. Like, right. uh, like a little bit of poison is okay, but a, you know, a lot of poison may not be okay. But the issue is whether a little bit of arsenic, I'm just using arsenic as an example, is okay, whether there should be any poisoning allowed. Well, um, you bring up a good point, Carl. Uh, and this, it is interesting having studied environmental law and a lot of the major acts from Clean Water Act to Clean Air Act and all that. I do find it interesting that most of them, they allow freebies for industry up to a certain level. You can, you can pollute, pollute, pollute up to here. <laughs> but then suddenly, there's standards above that. And then they're extrapolating from, say, what's happening to rats versus human beings, which is, I guess it's the standard in the field, but it's like LD50, lethal dose. One to 50% of the animals die. Okay, well, 
you know, there's a lot of things that can happen to you besides just dying. So I don't know what the, how good those standards are. But um, I think we do need a new approach that would basically say, you know, there is a book called Everything I Ever Learned, I Learned in Kindergarten. Clean up after yourself, whatever that is. If you're going to pollute the commons of the air, the land, or the water, I think for every pound of pollution, depending how toxic it is, you should pay. And I think the interesting that thing that would happen is that different sorts of energy uh, or industries would begin to incorporate the actual costs of pollution. And that the less polluting industries will find that they can compete much better. So you take something like, like nuclear energy, Carl, I know you're big on that, but uh, nuclear energy, you know, first of all, no one will insure it. You need the Price-Anderson Act. It's so dangerous, only the government will touch it with insurance. That's already a sign. And that at a limited level. <laughs> limited level, oh yeah. And then, you know, then you take transporting the dangers with that, uh, exposure, the danger to that, an age of terrorism, what would happen with that? If, if nuclear power had to, you know, compete in the private market, which a lot of the big businesses are always talking about, free capitalism, laissez-faire, if they had to actually be laissez-faire, they couldn't exist because it's too dangerous. And similarly, if you made you know, oil companies absorb their cost, or coal, which is pretty dirty, absorb their cost, they're all really absorbing all their costs and not getting all these freebies into our air and our water and our land. I believe things like wind would be much more competitive, um, solar would be much more competitive. Um, I think the competition would be, would be much better. Now, you grew up in West Islip, yes. Western Long Island, and then you've come out, you've been here, you've been on the East End for since you were a young, young woman. Yes. How did growing up in West Islip kind of educate yourself in terms of your activities as an environmental lawyer on the East End? That's a great question, Carl. Well, I grew up on the Great South Bay, um, and uh, my brother was a clamor, and my siblings were surfers. I'm, I'm a surfer. Um, so I think just loving, loving these things, loving clean water, loving surfing, loving clean air. Uh, we went on vacations in, in Vermont, so I really had an appreciation of the natural world. And then when I came out east as a kid, like at 18, um, on a bike trip, I was so amazed. The, when I grew up in West Slice, all the ponds, you couldn't swim in them. I came out here, I was swimming in Trout Pond up in Noyak. Um, the ocean was cleaner here. The farmland was open, our farmland was all closed out. So I grew up in sort of a very suburban, sprawling community. And when I came to the East End and saw these um, very quaint hamlets, uh, nice local newspapers that followed the news, um, open farmland, I was very, very um, impressed. And I resolved I would preserve what I love so much. These days, with the Trump administration rolling back a lot of environmental legal protections, I, how deeply concerned are you about that? Um, I'm very concerned, Carl. Um, we, my family is very divided. We have some very pro-Trump people in the family, some <laughs> anti-Trump people in the family, uh, family and uh, we have some very interesting Thanksgiving uh, discussions, <laughs> shall we, we say. I try to be very fair about the whole thing and really uh, look at uh, the good things he's done and some of the bad things. Um, on the environment, he's terrible. Uh, it's just just awful, you know. I don't I don't know why he, he doesn't appreciate um, that. If, if you want to be a conservative in this country, truly conservative, the wealth of the nation comes from our natural resources. That is what America is all about. Everything from you know our wetlands and our bays and our water bodies. And when you look across party lines, both the Republicans and the Democrats are very pro-environmental. And I, I believe that the Trump administration and the Republicans in general, because they rate much lower on environmental protection, although they're still interested, I'm talking about the politicians, um, I think they're making a bad mistake on the environment. I think it's a very bad call. And for the Democrats, I think the Democrats come out swinging on the environment. Don't be timid about it. Um, it, plus, you can tie the whole argument in now. I mean, do we really need to be so dependent on Middle Eastern oil? Why don't we talk more about conservation? Let's talk about things that don't pollute as much. That's a good long-term energy policy in an age of terrorism where they can come in, say, bomb your nuclear power plants. What are we doing with nuclear? Um, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense from a um, truly conservative point of view, which I'll, I'll go back to the real roots of that word. And it doesn't make sense from a national protection point of view, I think. Uh, and it doesn't make sense for 
when you step back from everything, Carl, people want to have fun. They want to go in the ocean. They want it to be clean. They want to go and they want to go to a local farm field and have some, you know, fruit and veggies. Uh, they want to they want to see these things. They love these things. So I, I think it's a mistake not to protect what people love. Now another battle that you have fought through the years involves the armoring of the shoreline. Describe why you're opposed to uh, groins and these other uh, uh, hard devices along the shoreline. Right, right. I had a big battle many years ago in uh, Bridgehampton. It was the Gordon v. Rush case. And the plans were appalling there. They were going to do a half a mile of uh, you know, shore hardening structures. And um, at one point, one of the homeowners, um, and, and you can't blame people for wanting to protect their homes, Carl, but you can't do it at the public expense. At one point, one guy, he put a coffer dam out into the ocean. It was like a city block, and there was a 20-foot high steel wall on the beach. And I walked down the beach, and I was looking up at this metal, rusty uh, steel wall. And then later on, after they pumped all the water out of the city block coffer dam, he had uh, these six-foot sandbags at the base of his house, and it looked like a pyramid from Egypt on the, on the beach. And I thought, oh, my God, this is the future of our area. And that's when I decided, standing on that horrible sandbag structure and looking at this coffer dam with, with the pumps going, yeah. The water out. So I'm going to run for office. I'm just sick of oh, this. Oh, really? That's what started. Yeah, that started it. I always had a big. I said, I, you know, I've been fighting the, the politicians from outside. I'm just going to have to be one of these politicians. And I don't want to be, but I will. And so that's when I ran for office. So the main thing with them is, um, you. The coast is very interesting from a property rights perspective. As the ocean moves in, uh, the the public actually owns up to mean high tide. Okay. And so as the, the ocean moves in and the, a lot of the barrier islands are rolling back, so literally the public ownership is rolling with the sea. When you put a steel structure in like that, the public ownership starts to roll in and bam, it hits the wall. So what ends up happening is you basically end up stealing the public's land because the, and the public can get squeezed between these metal structures or these sandbags or whatever they are and, and the sea. So there's a theft of the public lands, which is a problem. Um, and it's just, uh, I guess the main thing is when, you go, when I go to the beach or when getting back to enjoyment again of life and what do people love best, when you look at surveys, everyone always talks about that wonderful walk on the beach. And looking down the beach, say, in Hampton Bays and seeing naturalness on the Barrier Island, um, Montauk, seeing that sweep of coast, it's so beautiful. So when suddenly you're seeing steel walls and you're seeing six-foot sandbags and you're seeing things tattered in the wind and you're getting squeezed, and remembering my little old mom for a walk and she got squeezed between one of these copper dams on the sea. Um, it's got to be a better way. I think the better way is move back uh, as the sea comes in. And then probably the most important thing is going to be post-storm recovery. And I don't know if the governments are working on that yet, but they really should have a plan when the big one comes in, and it will, especially with sea level rise, which there's a lot of deniers on that, uh, but it is happening. Um, the question is, how will you treat people fairly if, say, their motel has gone in the water or their house has gone in the water? I would say you would have a very, politically, it would make the most sense to have a very generous um, program to adequately compensate them, compensate them or maybe even overcompensate them so that that particular motel or whatever it is is not in the water or a few feet from the beach and people leave happily having been paid handsomely. That to me is probably one of the best solutions. Post-storm post recovery. Yeah, and also there's a savings there in terms of the taxpayer not having to bail out these folks by right. Oh, trying to uh, allow them to rebuild where they... Yes, there's a very, I mean, you hear a lot of talk now, Fox News and all that, you know, they're always complaining about socialism, socialism, and yeah. I, I said we don't really, we do have some socialism, it's interesting. We, we have um, capitalism, it seems, with the big in industrial corporations, the big polluters when it comes to their profits, and we have socialism when it comes to their losses. So we have the worst of both worlds. <laughs> So it's laissez-faire, well, you know, I'm polluting or whatever I'm doing. And, or in the bank scams, it's all laissez-faire until I need a bailout. Now it's socialism. Um, so we don't even get, if you got a real socialism, maybe you'd get some socialism benefits as well, but we have corporations getting the benefits. 
or you have the very, very wealthy getting bailed out. Let's take, take Hampton Bay. You have the very, very wealthy on the Barrier Beach who will be bailed out by the blue-collar guy in Hampton Bays when their mansion goes in the drink and they have to pay for it. Um, so I, I'd rather see true capitalism. Like if you want to build that, you know, take, you take the risks. Take the rewards, you take the risks. Yeah. And just with a couple of minutes left, it isn't just drinking water that's threatened on the East End, but surface waters, ponds, and right. like what happened to West Islip, it's beginning to happen here. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, the, the ponds, we really need baseline data from the trustees. I don't know how much they have in terms of the water quality in the ponds, and we need a plan. A lot of them are aging prematurely. It's called eutrophication. They're, the swimming quality is going down. Um, you're getting more plant life growing. Like you take trout pond. Came here, love trout pond when mm -hmm. I came with my initial bike trip out here. Cleanest water, it was actually exposed to aquifer, you could drink it. Now a golf course went up the hill from that, uh, and that all those pollutants are coming down. You can't, you never quite know whether there's a causal connection. Maybe there is, maybe there's not, but it's pretty suspicious. Now you go into trout pond and where you used to swim cleanly across that lake, you know, you have a lessened quality of swimming. You have the reeds tickling your belly and it's just it's kind of murky. So with a lot of the ponds, you really, you could use a, a program with say conservation easements around the ponds, what the towns could do, keep it natural. Uh, maybe a tax incentive if they do maybe holding tanks or something or, or new advanced septic systems where they uh, get some kind of a t either tax break. Um, natural buffers where they're not using those pesticides and all that. There's a lot that you could do, Carl, but that, that's a big concern. Carolyn Zank, an environmental attorney par excellence, sir. Her knowledge, her understanding should be heeded. Thanks for thank you, Carl. being with me, Carolyn, and thank you for watching. Thank you. Carolyn Zank, attorney at law, thank you so much. <laughs> Carl, grossman. <laughs>